Yeah, finding your way in the world and what makes a good map. So we'll start out, so what actually is a map? So according to Wikipedia, a map is a symbolic depiction emphasising relationships between elements of some space, such as objects, regions, or themes. Or you could sort of sum it up, it's a picture of how stuff relates to some other stuff. And uh, the classic London tube map is a great example of that. It's a good depiction of how the train stations and the train lines all relate to each other. A treasure map, also another great example. It's like all the features that you choose are most important to get on there and how they all relate to each other and how they get you to find the treasure at the end. Or a topo map or a topographical map, um, which is yeah another picture accurately showing all the ground topology and how it all fits together. So anyway, what makes a good map? So it must be informative. It's got to show some good information that you're after. It's uh, got a good balance of being detailed but still legible. Um, the information on it ought to be accurate. It ought to be practical to use. That's always pretty handy. And the information on it should be current and up to date. So we'll start with informative. We'll do a wee bit of a case study out at Lincoln Uni. So I got my wife M to draw a map of how she would get from her uni hall through to um, the lecture theatre in the landscape department. Um, so yeah, great map. Um, got just the features that she thought you'd need to get there, um, and a whole lot, not a whole lot else. So nice and quick and easy to make. Um, yeah, and then the Google, Google version. So um, any information about the area that anybody else might think you ever want to know all chucked in on top of a nice uh, satellite image, um, complete with all the information over here, like the address, opening hours, website, phone number, reviews, and directions to how to get there. A different version, the orienteering version. So this is um, more about all the features and more about how to get between them and how to sort of accurately and quickly navigate your way around. So I've got to zoom in a bit more and so it goes right into full detail of having all the open grassland here and scattered trees and paved areas. And, and then you start getting into the trees and they've mapped the forests with white, like really fast open tree, um, forest to run through, just high canopy. Then you move into the greens and it's got multiple different shades of green. You can see three different greens through here, all on, based on how hard it is to run through. And then if you get in the dark green over here, you get stuck in that stuff and you can lose a lot of time in the race. Not so great if you're, uh, when you're racing against the clock. And then you've got the survey vision. So there's an old survey plan that I pulled out. And there's not really a whole lot of information on that one, but it's easily the most accurate information on there. <laughs> um, but it only really tells you where the boundaries are and what the lot areas would be. So move on. How detailed is it versus how legible? So. Christchurch version of the London tube map. So minimal detail, but it's nice and easy to read. You can, um, it's great for choosing which bus line you'd need to get on to um, in order to get yourself into town. But when you get into town, it's not so great at helping you find the, like, the cafe that you were meaning to meet your friends at. And the, the opposite end of the spectrum, the orient, back to the orienteering maps again. So this here's the map of Castle Hill, the rocks at Castle Hill, and this is like a, a standard Swedish orienteering terrain. Um, so the mappers do all they can to cram in as much detail as possible. Right through to the point where, like, yeah, you're trying to find an individual rock in the middle of here and navigate your way around, but the idea is to, um, well, the real skill of orienteering is to actually simplify all that detail down and only read the, like, couple of rocks that you really need. There's so much detail that that's the main skill in orienteering. What doing that while you're running full speed over rough ground, up and down hills, and under oxygen depth. So <laughs> this bit here, this is like we're getting to the true nerd night part here, so I geek out a bit with, with the survey background. So how accurate is the information on the map? So there's a guy at work, and he loves to always have the survey team on about being the local branch of the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> I, wish, I wish that was the case. It would make our lives a whole lot easier. So. Yeah, we talk about a round earth, especially when you're talking to flat earthers, but um, it's not actually round. To be 
perfectly correct. It's an ellipsoid. So it's not a huge amount different from sort of upways to outwards, but just enough to really screw with the maths. Um, yeah, fun fact for the evening. If you're standing on the poles, you actually experience stronger gravity than what you do if you're standing on the equators because of the slightly different distances. So this is where you start trying to get around Earth on a flat piece of paper. So this weird picture here, a little bit creepy, <laughs> or a lot, um, is a human head shown in the same way that your standard world map is shown. <laughs> so you see it's quite relatively normal through the eyes and the ears, the right sort of detail, and then you start looking a bit closer at like the top of his giant forehead and this massive square chin out here that's all being pretty, pretty um, heavily distorted. It just gives you a wee bit of an idea of how much like the, uh, the standard world map that you all think of as the world, how much that's stretched and squeezed to fit it on a page, on a nice flat bit of paper. So this is how you go about it, essentially. So you start with um, a model of the Earth uh, with a, a light source in the middle, let's say, and then you would wrap a cylinder around that. And that light source would pass through the surface of the Earth and project the land masses onto the surface of the cylinder. And then, so you unroll the cylinder then, and then you use some fancy maths to try and reduce the distortion a little bit, and voila, you've got round to flat, in a sense. Uh, so this is, this is a really cool post I found as well, about sort of sums up the, all the different projections that everybody uses and different ways that you can try and flatten out the Earth and fit it on one page. So you can see again, through the equators, it's, it's like, sort of just discernible as to what you're looking at, but as soon as you try and flatten out the poles, it just screws it up pretty massively. And just in case you're wondering, <laughs> Linz was kind enough to um, publish the, the equations for how to convert the latitudes and longitudes um, on the, the datum that we used into easting and northern coordinates that you can, on a nice flat plane that are nice and easy to use. So all you need to do is you need to work out these values here so you work out them individu individually, and then you work out these values here, and you plug them into this equation over here, just a little bit of plug and chug, and you get some nice easy coordinates to use on your nice flat plane. But really, how accurate do you actually need to be using? So this here is a survey plan that I've used um, at work a couple of months ago, actually. So it's centimetre accurate, well, 30 to 50 centimetres accurate, or do you actually just need the relative accuracy of the, um, the London tube map here? And then, uh, so how practical is the map to use? It's also quite important. So yeah, there's Google Maps for the win here. It's um, in your pocket, so it's super accessible, up to date, um, and yeah, all live, and, um, and all the detail that you could want. So I mentioned earlier, like, all the points that people um, Anybody can put, put any information on, and there's heaps of data there that you can pull out um, for each location. Yeah, right through again, heaps of reviews and directions on how to get there, opening hours, a little bit dodgy on week, uh, holidays, but um, yeah, so Google Maps will win, really. So, there's a question. How many of you, when you go out tramping, would take your, your compass and your map with you? How many of you can also tell me the difference between true north, grid north, and magnetic north? <laughs> true north and grid north, they're semantics, really. But um, the difference to, um, to magnetic north is actually like significant, and it's worth knowing about if you want to ac um, accurately navigate one of the topo map. Um, so yeah, the, the north magnetic pole isn't, isn't actually in the same place. It's a geographic north pole. It's in the north end of Canada. So yeah, obviously, different directions from where we are, so they're a different angle. Um, if you've looked closely at a hard copy of the topo map, you would have seen this diagram here before. Uh, so that shows you the offset um, of how far different it actually is, so how far different your compass would need to be relative to the north lines on the map here. <laughs> this one here, this is, well, you can't see it at all up here, but that's all right. The next one for context. So this here, I um, came across this map in a 
museum in Amsterdam, and it's, I think it's my absolute favorite. Walked into the room and I was just like, oh wow. Um, so yeah, this is, was made by some Dutch merchants trying to schmooze the um, King Richard II in 1660. Um, yeah, they made him this gift, and yeah, here we go. There's a bit of context. This thing's massive. I think it's 1.7 meters by 1.9 meters tall. Um, and the, the maps in it were, it was amazingly ornate and a really awesome picture as well. And this is just another cool globe that I saw at the same exhibition that was worth including. So, how up to date is the information on the map? It's also quite important. It's Google Maps for the win <laughs> here. Um, like, Google Maps has really actually been, probably been pretty revolutionary, really. Probably, well, in my opinion anyway, about the best thing that's come out of, that's come out of smartphones. Um, so yeah, you've got like uh, all the, the blockage information. If it's enough, it'll give you time delays, alternate routes, rolling ETAs for how long it'll take, what time you might actually arrive at your destination. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, really. And then Captain Cook's map of New Zealand. Bit of a different story. So it's a great one if you're, when you're <laughs> seafarer trying to suss out um, and tell your king back home what countries might be worth colonising. <laughs> but you wouldn't want to guide anyone into Littleton Port with this. <laughs> and then uh, a similar sort of situation. <laughs> a little bit older, though. This is possibly one of the oldest maps that they've found. This was um, in Egypt, uh, and a map that was designed to uh, help navigate a quarrying crew to some... Um, to a mine to bring back a whole bunch of rock to make into gods and rich people. So the moral of the story, horses for courses really. It's all about how effectively the map that you've got balances all these different factors to show you what you're really looking to, to get out of the map. Um, so it's kind of like a different balance with the map that M drew in five, maybe 10 minutes time. Gets you, gets you to the lecture theater, but then Google Maps took a bit more money and time to build, but it's pretty awesome as well. And uh, this one here is a, this is apparently the, about the most proportionally accurate um, world map that, that's out there. There's a, a Japanese architect uh, designed this projection where he uses a whole heap of triangles and projects the land masses onto that and then lays them all out flat. And, but yeah, I don't see that map replacing the standard map you've seen on, on every <laughs> classroom wall anytime soon. So, I'll move on, I'll just show you a few of my um, favorite examples. So this one here, I think this has got to be about my favorite survey plan. This is an actual survey plan that I've, I've used for work um, up at Lake Taylor here. So they went up there and this is uh, hardly new, in 1917 and they went through with a, a proper old theodolite and chain and measured all of these traverse lines the whole way along. So I don't know if you've got any idea of the scale, but that's a bloody long way. It's a little bit different to a couple of years ago when I drove up the gravel road in my ute, parked up and pulled out my GPS. <laughs> Slightly different scenario. But I love the, the detail as well. The sort of talks about sunny slopes carrying good tussock for, uh, I think they were sizing up some high country pastoral releases at the time. You contrast that to a survey plan that I created uh, like last year. It's not nearly as pretty. I'm definitely not the artist that the uh, old Mr. Waters was. And uh, another really cool story that I found <laughs> in, my, in my research. So this was about an American um, mapping firm and a couple of guys got their heads together in the 1930s and they decided that they um, wanted to head off anybody at the pass about if they were um, intending to plagiarise their maps at all. So I thought, here's a great idea. We'll chuck in a fake town. <laughs> and then if anybody publishes a map that has their fake town in it, they can blatantly say that you guys plagiarised my map. <laughs> their idea was going great until somebody decided that they wanted to build a general store in the vicinity, <laughs> found their map and called it the Aglo General Store. <laughs> I thought it was a great story. It doesn't exist anymore, apparently, though. And everyone's favorite map, isn't it? I mean, it's not super accurate to ground. It's not very really practical to use, but that's uh, great. Hell of a lot of fun. 
quite possibly the worst map out there. <laughs> yeah, as you can tell. Yeah, I was going to say, anybody over 35 has probably had a run-in with one of these at least once. <laughs> so Em and I have got a couple of good stories from our travels. There was um, one time we were driving through a pass in Switzerland and we took a wrong turn at the top of the pass, went down the wrong valley, and in the next village they were speaking Italian. We were expecting German. <laughs> There's another better one though, I think when we were trying to go from um, Interlaken through to Zim um, Zermatt, we were going to and, go and visit the Matterhorn, and we had mapped out this great route, shortest way we could find, over this mountain pass. So we start driving up the valley anyway, heading up towards this pass, and the weather starts closing and looking a bit ominous, and I'm sort of sitting there in the driver's seat getting a bit nervous, thinking, oh, this is going to be interesting. A bit of snow on the top of the pass. And then we get to the last town in the valley, and we come to this toll gate. So we come up to the gate and we pay our money. Okay, whatever, we dutifully pay that. And then we go, keep going a little bit further. And then we come around the corner and there's a car park. And there's one car parked in the car park. So we go, what the hell is going on here? We park up next to that car. We're like, what is going on? So we pull out the pamphlets that they gave us at the toll gate. And then we realized that we had actually bought a train ticket <laughs> rather than paid a toll. So we drove our car onto the back of this train <laughs> and the train took us through the, uh, through the hillside. And you see a wee bit of the bad weather up there that I was getting nervous about. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Made for a couple of great photos and a bit of fun playing some card games on the driver's seat while we were honing along through the tunnel. So yeah, anyway, that's all I've got. Um, yeah, and a special thanks to Papo for providing me with some of the maps. Um, and if you're remotely interested in having a go at orienteering, there's the website there, and we've got all the events on the website. So, yeah, anyone got any questions? Oh, okay, so this is your standard topographical map. So this is the national map series. They make these at one to 50,000 scale. So each, each grid square is a, is a kilometre. And the, the red lines, they're roads. They're sealed roads. Yeah, yep, so this is... Um, yeah. Oh, right, so that's Dyer's Pass. Yeah, okay, so all of these squiggly lines through here. Yeah, yeah, they're the contours. So they're at a 20 metre interval. So that's 20 metres of elevation over that distance. Um, so there's, there's a 200 metre contour, the 400 metre contour there. So above, I was going to say sea level, but it won't actually be sea level. It's probably the ellipsoid there and blah, blah, blah. The surveyor and me coming out. Um, and there's a high point there with, at 490 as well. So, yeah. One in the back. Uh, I don't know, that's an interesting one, but I don't know whether that's just Google Maps. I do actually, it's got a story come to mind from a, a friend who's an orienteer as well, but he's also a research scientist and was doing some site visits in the middle of a forest with a couple of other people. And just being an orienteer, like, it freaks me out a little bit if I don't know where North is. So Em can attest to this, she was in one place in Singapore, she loved it, I turned the wrong way at this one intersection every time. But, um, and he was saying he went in with this group of, I think it was maybe two or three of them, and they went into this one spot, did a whole bunch of samples, and then they got up to leave, and the other girl that he was with went to walk off in the complete opposite direction. I think this was before Google Maps was really nearly as big a thing as it is now, so I don't know if that's been a problem all along anyway. <laughs> some people just don't, like, aren't as in tune with 
I, well, I don't know. Okay. Maybe that's just because I'm an orientee and I'm used to following and keeping a good track of exactly where I've come from and that. But, um, but yeah, it's a definite, it's a definite possible issue. Thank you. 